Father Adam, welcome. Just to begin with, I was wondering if you'd like to share with us the name and the name of a mentor of yours that means a lot and, and what makes him mean so, him or her mean so much in your life. Thank you so much for uh, inviting me here to, uh, to speak to you. Uh, it's a great joy to be here. Um, I had many, many mentors uh, in my life, as I'm sure you, uh, you have as well. The name that is coming up for me today is Rabbi Yehuda, uh, Yehuda Fine, who was um, and is an extraordinary human being. Uh, he spent about a couple of decades uh, working with uh, young people struggling with homelessness on the streets of New York City. Uh, he's a very special guy, you know, in the 60s and 70s, where a lot of, when a lot of people were going uh, to see all the gurus and Eastern teachers that were coming here to the U.S., um, he went also and so many of them and somehow was not fully impressed. Um, and he felt that since he was born into a Jewish family, maybe he could go to the Holy Land and meet some of those uh, spiritual masters, some of those Hasidic masters who survived the Holocaust. And that's what he did. And he studied there with some of those guys for about 10 years. And then after coming back to the U.S., uh, he decided to serve in this unique way on the streets of New York City instead of starting a congregation. His congregation was a group of homeless youth. And he gave me this very important lesson early on in life where he said that I'm here to fix just one thing. He said, everyone is here to fix just one thing. And no one else can do it. It's just you who needs to do what you are called to do. And he, told me, and he also told me to say to go into the darkness of Manhattan and to look for sparks of light hidden there, uh, that some of those sparks of light that were scattered uh, among the homeless youth were assigned to me and that my job was to cultivate them and to raise them up. Uh, and to, so that's how my calling and vocation uh, to be and to accompany homeless youth really came into being. So this is the person that I would like to celebrate today, Rabbi Yehuda Fine. Thank you for that question, Bill. Thank you, Father. Tony, if you could just remove me from the image, if you haven't already, and so we just say Father Adam. Thank you. All right. So again, thank you for uh, inviting me here. I thought that maybe I would start with a guided meditation for all of us to really arrive into this space, into this community, into this present moment. So I would like to invite you to find a comfortable position, sitting in a way that would allow you to be relaxed and open and also alert. And then let's just take a couple of breaths together, using our breath to become aware of what is really present in us and around us, calling us back into this present moment, calling us back into our bodies, calling us back into our hearts. And so take a breath with me, breathing in and then breathing out. Breathing in and breathing out. And then allowing our breath to return to normal. And then with everything that is present in us, just placing ourselves in the presence of the divine. Trusting that this holy 
being, holy love is here with us, ready to embrace us just as we are. with all of our stuff. And I'll start with a prayer before the guided meditation. Come God, come to us. Enter our darkness with your light. Fill our emptiness with your presence. Come, refresh, restore, renew us. In our sadness, come as joy. In our troubles, come as peace. In our fearfulness, come as hope. In our darkness, come as light. In our frailty, come as strength. In our loneliness, come as love. Come, refresh, restore. Renew us right now. And so now sitting in the presence of the sacred, sitting in the presence of the holy, I would like to invite you to start by gently noticing what is alive in you right now. As you look within yourself, what do you find there? What shows up right away? And what is reluctant to show up? And as you are noticing all of those things that are present in you, begin to Acknowledge each of them, all the feelings, sensations that you are carrying in your body, in your heart, and in your mind right now. And also become aware that you are sitting in the presence of the divine. A presence which is unconditional love. A place where there is no need to hide anything at all. So let's just welcome this good news that no matter what you are feeling right now, no matter what kind of difficulties, pains, mistakes, shame, isolation you may be carrying right now, the divine is longing to receive you just as you are, without exception. And so in the presence of God, try to notice everything that is present in you. Try to name it and also try to locate it in your body. Discover where each of those things that you are noticing and naming, where do they live in your body? Where does your pain live in your body right now? What about your disappointments? What about those things that you never speak of because you are too ashamed to name them? Where are they in your body? What about your joys, your hopes, and your longings? Where do they live in your body? And so just take a moment to feel all of those things and to locate each of those things in your body, welcoming them, inviting them in, 
knowing that there's enough space here for all that is present within you. And then one by one, invite all of those things into your heart, into your spiritual center. If you like, you can envision them moving slowly into your heart, like rivers coming together in one place. Bringing all that is present in you into your sacred center. And especially invite into your heart those things that normally you might exclude or overlook in your daily life or in your spiritual practice, knowing again that your heart is big enough to hold everything that is alive in you. And then when you are ready, lift your hands from where they are resting and place the palms of your hands on your heart, gently embracing all of those bits and pieces of your life which you have brought into God's presence and hold these important parts of yourself with tenderness and care. Hold them just as if you were holding a little baby with that same kind of gentleness, love, and wonder. All of these pieces are part of you and you are a child of the divine. So just take a moment, embracing compassion for all that is within you all that you are carrying in your heart right now. And now, whenever you are ready, just rest in silence for a moment, imagining that just as you are holding all of those bits and pieces of your life with tenderness and care, that now the divine, however you envision it to be, imagine that the divine is holding you with even greater love and care. And so just allow yourself to simply rest in this gentle embrace for a couple of minutes, imagining that your whole being is like a sponge and that right now you're simply soaking in this great luminosity and healing power of the divine. Say yes to it. Welcome it. Enjoy it as you are resting in silence, in the state of openness, receptivity, and consent. And now, whenever you're ready, you can gently return to your breath, 
to your body. Concluding with a prayer or a thank you. A sense of gratitude to the divine. For this wonderful community of men. For this heartful community of men. And then just opening your eyes when you're ready. Thank you so much for practicing with me. And so today I wanted to talk to you about this journey towards wholeness, towards our calling, towards receptivity, where we can become a vehicle through which the divine lives, through which the divine works, through which the divine protests, says yes and no. And I'm going to speak about it in terms of my own story, as this is the story that I am most familiar with. And I'll share my story with you, not so much because I think that it's extraordinary or very special, but rather so uh, hopefully you can hear things in it that can invite you to reflect on your own story. Uh, I remember Father Thomas Kidding, another one of my uh, mentors, uh, once said towards the end of his life that after 90 some years on this planet, he's discovered that the best way to teach spirituality is through gatherings like this one when we can share our stories with each other. And so I'll speak in that tradition, so to speak. And so my life began in Poland. Uh, you can probably hear my accent very well. I was born and grew up in Poland. I was born in 1975 and uh, spent uh, the first decade and some of my life under a totalitarian regime. My life in many ways was really wonderful. I had a good family and, and great parents who really loved me. But all around me, there was a lot of chaos. There was a lot of violence. When Poland went into the state of emergency, um, or the state of war, as we called it, uh, in 1981. Uh, all of a sudden, you know, we saw tanks on our streets. It was literally like living in a war zone. And so early on in my life, I realized that I basically have two choices that I could make. One choice was to do what a lot of my friends and people around me were doing, was to essentially drink, to numb myself, to numb my pain. Uh, and I saw a lot of that happening, you know, during the 1980s. Um, it was difficult to get food, especially good quality food, but alcohol was always available in stores. It was easier for the regime to control us, you know, if we were intoxicated. And so a lot of the people that I knew, that was their therapeutic methodology of dealing with their pain, you know, to drink, to cry, and to just surrender to this pain that they were feeling, hoping that somehow it would go away. Another way that I thought or another choice that was available to me was to become an activist, uh, to become a change maker. And I saw a lot of that around me as well. Uh, you know, more than 60 or 70% of the whole country existed outside of the, uh, you know, the official party, uh, communist parties kind of 
way of being with you know our own underground ways of passing on information our own hassling schemes to get uh, access to food our own international networks all around eastern europe where we could go you know all the way to turkey buy things then sell things you know in soviet union and romania and hungary and and other places and so I saw a lot of people saying no to the system and trying to articulate something that could help us to transition into a new system, into a new way of life, and also into a new way of making decisions, into something that would be stamped with the stamp of democracy. And at that time, a lot of those people that especially impressed me were priests. Catholic priests. In Poland, more than 95% of all people were Catholic at that time. And churches were really the only places where we could experience freedom, where we could be free to articulate our dreams. The church was very powerful, and somehow the control of the Communist Party uh, would not enter there. I mean, there are a lot of people who are trying to infiltrate and et cetera. But my experience of the church was as this autonomous zone, freedom of longing, of dreams. And so as a kid, I got fascinated with these two activist priests. The first one was Father Jerzy Popiuszko, and the second one was Stanisław Suchowolec. And I was so kind of taken but by what I saw in them, and both of them were these kinds of nonviolent, you know, Gandhi-like figures who preached nonviolence, who talked about forgiveness, who named all the evils of our world, and who were not afraid to stand up and speak, to gather people, and to infuse them with this power that came from something that was beyond just who they were. And so I was so inspired by them that, you know, at home, I would try to do what they did in church by building a little altar, you know, wrapping myself in some kind of a white blanket, thinking that it's a vestment and trying to celebrate mass. And that was one of my first, you know, spiritual experiences, really. I remember standing there by this homemade altar and feeling this presence that felt like a motherly presence of love. And all of a sudden I felt like even though the whole world around me was falling apart, even though on TV I saw images of people being run over by tanks, nonetheless, there was something that I could rely on, this presence, this love. And of course in Poland, we kind of externalize God as this Black Madonna, uh, mother of Częstochowa. You know, you might have seen this sacred icon with two scars on her face. And to us, that meant that there she is so close to us that she's feeling our pain. And she's there to hold us, to love us, to encourage us, and to help us deal with our pain. And so early on, I realized this connection, you know, that this is what those guys relied on, that power underneath it all that we can all have access to through prayer, through spiritual practice. And I also understood through them that to say yes to that presence, to truly be faithful to that presence, to truly say yes to God, it meant that we had to say no to everything that violated God's love and justice and truth in the world. And that's what I saw them living, this kind of a dialectic of a sacred yes and a sacred no. And so, as I looked into that, and as I immersed myself into that reality, I also got a very kind of early lesson in what it means to live this kind of a life. Both of those guys got killed by the government. And one of them was my parish priest. 
And so early on, I knew that to really say yes to God and to say no to injustice, it meant that we will most likely have to pay some consequences, that it will not be an easy journey. Because to say yes to God and to say no to injustice, that means that we will be oftentimes taken into conflict zones within our families, within our communities, within the institutions that we belong to. And so to me, that was really a foundational experience in life, that my life needed to be about prayer and about action. And that most likely it will not be easy if I choose to really follow that calling that I was so deeply feeling in my bones. At the age of 17, I came to the US. We came here as undocumented immigrants. We came here to, to New York City because that's you know where a huge Polish community was. It was easier to find employment. Uh, and it was a terrifying reality to come here without knowing English, um, to be taken out of my world, the world that perhaps was kind of not very pleasant at times, but nonetheless, it was all that I was familiar with. And so coming to New York City, I eventually started experiencing, you know, some uncomfortable things, my trauma, so to speak, from childhood started catching up with me. And I was experiencing panic attacks and other things, kind of standard post-traumatic disorder symptoms. Um, initially, you know, no one really knew what it was about. We didn't have health insurance. So, you know, I would go to some kind of underground, you know, doctors and things and uh, it took a while to figure out what was happening. But as a result of that, I was sent to a counselor, a Polish woman who was a devotee of a Hindu spiritual master. And she taught me meditation. And as I started practicing, you know, literally within two weeks, I felt like my life had changed. And all of a sudden, I was again in touch with that reality with that ground of being and aliveness with that something that gave myself a sense of security with that something that I could trust that's something that I felt when I was a kid that motherly presence that could hold me even if things were falling apart around me and in me and so you know, because my kind of wellness, if you will, came through meditation within a few weeks or a couple of months, I think it took, I went and um, decided to, uh, you know, move into a Hindu monastery because I felt that perhaps that's where my answers would be found. And I remember, you know, the way that I connected with the monastery, this counselor and teacher gave me an address of a spiritual bookstore, you know, in New York City. For those of you who maybe have are familiar with New York City, it was East-West Books that no longer exists, but that's where all the seekers would go. You know, it had an amazing, I mean, selection of books and classes. And I remember entering, picking up the first book that I saw, it was called Living with the Himalayan Masters. And I opened the book and on the there was a picture of this Indian sadhu or a monk with long, long dreadlocks, you know, just a guy walking in the Himalayas. And I remember like, I already have dreadlocks. This is my guy. I'm going to do what he does, you know. And being in that Hindu monastery really gave me a structure for a contemplative life and a way of practice, a way of quieting my mind, a way of getting my body and my emotions in order, a way of harmonizing so I could show up and be in the state of receptivity to God. Eventually that took me to India and I kind of followed on that journey to try to become, you know, a monastic. Uh, and at that point, I guess, 
I bought into this idea that to be spiritually advanced, it meant disconnecting and detaching from everything and sitting in some kind of a cave or on top of a mountain and contemplating God and achieving this sense of great peace, you know, not being touched by the winds of the world, so to speak. And, you know, that happened for a while. I went to India. I lived in a hermitage uh, in the Himalayas for a little bit. But on my way to that hermitage, I met a homeless child, a girl who was probably 13, just skin and bones. You know, her face was burned with cigarettes. And she just came up to me, took my hand and started walking with me. And something happened. And all of a sudden, just seeing her, I started feeling like this little child is a call that I needed to answer. It's like all of a sudden, you know, I felt that whatever my life needs to be, it needs to somehow incorporate this homeless child, this girl who was bought and sold many times, this girl who was being taken advantage. And, you know, some guy from Holland was making porn films with her as I later uh, discovered this little girl who was on the street with her two younger brothers, one of whom was eight and the other one was 10. And so after having this experience, you know, I called a friend of mine um, whom I met in Europe and he was this kind of very strange character. He used to be a heroin dealer in Amsterdam who ran an art gallery and he would always say that, you know, he was a junkie with a class. Um, and he had this experience, you know, at some point after being addicted for, I think, 15 years and selling heroin and running this extraordinary gallery. And, you know, he was a very kind of wild guy. He would make these outfits made out of like little pieces of mirrors. Um, so, you know, people would call him captain because he would take them on like some kind of psychedelic journeys and all. But at some point, his gallery got burned down. Uh, a lot of his friends started dying of AIDS. And he decided that he wanted to get clean. He moved into this abandoned basement in a squat in Amsterdam. And after a few days of basically fasting and almost dying, he had an experience of Christ. He saw a vision of Christ. That converted him into this kind of a crazy fundamentalist Christian. And he went to India trying to conquer India for Christ. But then when he got to India, <clears throat> he saw that, you know, he found a heroin addict dying on the street, uh, basically very close to death. And he decided that he will pick him up, rent a room and live with that man and try to nurse him back to life. Eventually, that kind of an experience, you know, kind of converted him into a different kind of Christianity, the kind of Christianity that embraced, you know, some of the Eastern traditions. And his little initiative of picking up that guy grew into this extraordinary village of broken people right outside of Delhi, which became this kind of a new monastic community where all the people res rescued from the streets of Delhi were brought and nursed back to life. Uh, street children, adults, elders. And so after having this experience with this teenage girl, you know, I called him and he invited me to move into his community and to work there with homeless uh, young people. They, I never forget my first day there, you know. They picked me up in a van. We were driving down the street, and all of a sudden, the volunteers stopped the van and said, you know, there's someone dying under the bridge. Follow me and help me. So we went there, and there were basically just a few guys sitting, passing on a big syringe, you know. Um, and one of the guys was just, again, skin and bones, you know, and, and the volunteer said, if I don't take him, he's going to die tonight. They started arguing, but finally the guy agreed. He picked him up. He brought him into the van and I was sitting right next to him. And it was just the smell of rottening flesh. And then they brought him into this rescue center, which was an old Shiva temple by the river Yamna. And I remember, you know, the guy's food was 
wrapped in some kind of a material and they unwrapped the foot and literally part of that foot just fell off. And someone said, wow, even the maggots are already dead. I remember being so frightened by that scene. It's like a baton in me was pushed and all of a sudden all of my insecurities, all of my fears came up at once and I just wanted to run and go back to New York, but I was too ashamed to do so. And as a result, I think something happened as I started sitting with the pain of the people that I was helping. There was this moment where something in me just kind of cracked. And all of a sudden, it felt like the part of my identity that wanted to objectify the pain of the other and to turn away from it, to protect myself, that part cracked. And all of a sudden, their pain was really an extension of my pain and vice versa. And so the natural thing to do would be, I mean, what do we do when our hand starts bleeding? We wash it, we take care of it, we clean it, and we put something on it. And so that was my next big lesson in my vocation, to approach the suffering of the world in that kind of a way. Eventually, that brought me back to New York, where we started this enterprise, helping homeless kids. And that was kind of when the final lesson came in being with those who suffer and what it means to essentially be an engaged contemplative, not just someone who prays, not just someone who practices meditation, but someone through whom that force of love can begin to live and work. As we started our center called the Reciprocity Foundation, we discovered that whatever we were doing, we were getting a lot of publicity. People were celebrating our work because we were using all kinds of innovative ways of, you know, dealing with youth homelessness. We were coming up with creative solutions and training all these big organizations. And, you know, a lot of it was also our youthful arrogance to show up to a meeting, you know, when we still didn't have an office because we couldn't afford it and to tell an organization that had, you know, like a 30 minute, $30 million budget that we can do things better. And some of that paid off. We got opportunities and things and eventually funding and eventually a beautiful center. But still, I discovered that our kids were going through our programs and ending up on the streets. We were helping them to essentially transition from the youth homelessness system to the adult homelessness system. And the two systems were disconnected, which meant that it looked like our kids were graduating and succeeding, and yet they were back on the street. And I remember, you know, that generated some crisis in my life because I felt like I was showing up as this kind of a professional who had skills and therapeutic techniques, who was there to really help people solve their life problems. And a mentor of mine, a monastic mentor of mine said, you know, how about if you start approaching each of the people who comes to you in the same way that you approach contemplative prayer? And at that time, my practice of contemplative prayer was about just simply being in the state of receptivity and openness before God, this state of consent, understanding that if we can be in the state of openness, God's spirit descends into our hearts. And all we have to do is just to say yes to it. So it can do the work of healing on us touching all of our wounds, touching all of our brokenness and transfiguring all of that stuff into something that could maybe even become our gift to the world. And so that's how I started showing up for young people. I would be there in this state of receptivity and openness 
And what that meant was that I was there to bear witness to their pain, to put everything that I knew, all of my skill sets aside, and to just simply bear witness to their pain without any buffers, to let go of my professionalized identity, and to simply accompany them into the depths of their pain, helping them to hold that, trusting that something good could happen in that way. And what I began discovering was that when we do that, when we show up in a way that allows the world to penetrate and maybe even to break our hearts, there is that underlying presence that I call God that enters into our midst and begins to pick up the broken pieces from the floor and begins to reassemble them into something that resembles healing, that resembles wholeness, that resembles joy. And when that happens, it's not even clear who is helping whom, because the person who is giving is receiving just as much. And I remember you know, coming across this teaching from that is oftentimes attributed to St. Teresa of Avila that says something like, uh, you know, Christ has no hands but yours to touch those who are broken. Christ has no eyes but yours to look at the world with compassion. Christ has no heart but yours to love those who are suffering. Christ has no feet but yours to walk towards all of those brokenness of the world so you can do something about it. Now, St. Teresa of Avila unfortunately never said it, but it's often attributed to her. But nonetheless, that was my experience that we can, if we can truly cultivate this sense of receptivity and listening, that impulse of God that is present deep within our hearts can begin to arise in us. And all we have to do is to say yes to it. And somehow through that experience, the right words, the right ways of being present begin to manifest in us. And it was also St. Augustine who said that deep within the innermost cabin of our hearts, there is a sleeping Christ. And that our job is to essentially wake him up so he can begin to live and love and work through us. And so in many ways, why am I telling you this? Well, I'm telling you this because this is all I know. This is how God showed up in my life. And that didn't mean that all of a sudden, you know, my, my issues were fixed. That didn't mean that, you know, I stopped, you know, somehow overnight, you know, my sense of, you know, anxiety and other things that I was experiencing my, in my life were fixed. That didn't mean that all of a sudden I knew how to fix all of my relationships. It just meant that there was something, something very sacred that I could rely on, that I could always return to. And that from that place, I could then look for a community of like-minded people that could support me. That from that place, I could look for the right kind of a therapist, for the right kind of a spiritual director, for the right kind of mentors that would allow me to do the inner work that I needed to do in order to every day, hopefully, take steps towards becoming more and more vehicle of God's goodness in the world. Um, you know, I never forget uh, one of my mentors who was a Sufi teacher said, you know, my goal in life is to let God live through me as much as possible, as often as possible. And so, Today, I believe that that is actually everyone's calling to let the divine live through us as much as, 
and as often as it is possible. And over the years, and maybe this is just and I'll conclude and then we can have a conversation. I think I can stop. I can talk for 10 more minutes or so. You know, over the years, I've seen many, many people that, that I've worked with, especially those people who are either on the margins or, or young activists who discovered their calling through following their heartbreak through facing their pain, through being with their pain, where somehow in that experience, that operating system that runs, that runs their lives cracks. And all of a sudden there's this infusion of something, of creativity, of grace, of insight that allows them to see, even if for a moment, what their lives need to be. And I just wanna tell you two stories two brief stories that I also tell in my new book, Let Your Heartbreak Be Your Guide. The first story happened uh, in London. Some years ago, I was invited to give a talk uh, to a group of young activists. And after that talk, one of the young people associated with this very special, and with this, let's call it a church, but it was really a center for peace and reconciliation that had an extraordinary history in 1980s. It was bombed, um, you know, and the Bishop of London, it was part of the Anglican uh, church structure. The Bishop of London decided that when they will rebuild the church, it will not serve as a regular church, but rather as a, as a center for uh, peace and reconciliation, where people who normally don't do well hanging out in the same space can come together and learn different methodologies to, to work towards reconciliation and justice and forgiveness. And so after that talk that I gave there, you know, out, right outside, they had this kind of a beautiful Bedouin tent that someone gifted them with. And a lot of their gatherings would happen there. I mean, you would just sit there and it really felt like you're in the desert in the sacred space. And so a young woman, you know, one of those young activists approached me and she said that she's struggling, like many young people are struggling because she can't really figure out what her calling in life was. She said, you know, people tell me to follow my passion passion, passion, passion. And she said, I've been trying to follow my passion. My, what I'm passionate about keeps on changing. And I still feel like I'm lost. There's this emptiness, this void inside of me that I'm feeling. And you know, to be quite honest with you, we talked maybe for about an hour. I almost missed my plane back to New York because we were talking and talking. And I felt like I had nothing to offer. You know, sometimes, I don't know if you have that experience, you're just slightly cut off from that source within you where maybe perhaps because I was preoccupied with making it to the airport, like, Whatever I was saying was just not happening. And all of a sudden I remembered an advice that one of my mentors gave me. Mm, you know, he said, don't follow your passion, don't follow your bliss. And I'm sure he was referring to one of those, you know, little stickers on cars that, that we've seen many of in, in 1990s and et cetera, follow your bliss. He said, don't follow your bliss. Look at the world and see where following our bliss has gotten us to. Instead, follow your heartbreak. And so that's what I did. I said, you know, why don't you have been following your passion for a long time? Doesn't seem like you're getting any results. How about following your heartbreak? And that was it. I forgot about the encounter. And then months later, I received a message from her. And she was, um, you know, in Greece at that time. And she said, I have to tell you what happened. She said, I, you asked me to follow my heartbreak to figure out what breaks my heart. I sat with it for a couple of months. And, and I felt like sitting with it just frustrated me and frustrated me and frustrated me. And she said, one Sunday afternoon, I was just so angry at you that you gave me this question that I was just like saying, screw it, you know, uh, screw that guy who gave me this thing. And she said, I just turned on the TV uh, wanting some entertainment, wanting a release. 
And she said, when I turned on the TV, I saw that it was BBC News. And on the news, I saw all these people escaping Syria and landing on this Greek island of Lesbos. They were running away from war. And she said, just looking at those images, something happened. And all of a sudden, I felt like what I'm seeing is breaking my heart. And she said, without telling a soul, I bought a ticket. Uh, didn't tell my parents, didn't tell my coworkers. I just emailed them that I need a week off. I bought a ticket and went there and joined the volunteers and started picking up all the children and mothers and fathers from the freezing sea and nursing them back to life. And she said, you know, being there broke my heart and brought me to my knees, but it also gave me a new life and a new joy. And she said, not a false kind of joy that is a result of avoiding life's discomforts, but rather a joy that knows difficulties and heartbreaks and yet still survives. A joy that is an assurance that you're doing what you were born to do, an assurance that you're saying yes to the person you are meant to be. And so after serving there, she went back to London and organized all of her friends at that Center for um, Peace and Reconciliation. And eventually that center became a huge support to all the refugees that were arriving in the UK from Syria. Even at some point as I was visiting, I even met a rabbi uh, who was part of that center who was organizing all of the Jewish refugees who had to run from um, Arabic speaking countries decades earlier. Uh, but they knew Arabic, and so he organized them so they could serve the newly arriving Syrian refugees as translators. And that just moved me so much because it became this extraordinary event where healing on both sides became possible. And so that's one story. And then the second story that I wanted to tell you was a story about a homeless kid that I uh, no, who, uh, you know, uh, still lives in New York City. Um, he was a kind of a very creative, you know, street smart kid. He was one of those guys, he would enter the room and the whole room would feel that this guy has something special. And he indeed had something special, but also he was born with HIV. And he didn't know it. Uh, but when he was, you know, early in his teens, his mom died of AIDS as his mom struggled with addiction. And that's when he was sat down by his family members and told that your life will be different and you may possibly die early uh, because you were born with this thing that, you know, uh, that we don't know um, how it will kind of rule your life. And so ended, he ended up in a foster care after his mom died, eventually ended up in a homeless shelter, and that's when I met him. And he always, you know, was ashamed about his HIV status um, because, you know, if he told other people, perhaps his peers would look at him differently. And so he came to me asking for some advice. He said, you know, um, I have this amazing opportunity to be a spokesperson for a huge uh, HIV awareness campaign. It pays really good money. I would be able to do some good service. Um, I would be able to finally have the kind of an apartment that I want to have and move out of the shelter. But it would mean that I have to go public about my HIV status. And... Obviously, I advised him against that because I knew that things would change. Uh, and so I advised him to, you know, pray about it, to sit with it. To, and, and we had that conversation. We didn't read any, we, did, we didn't reach any conclusions. And then after that, he disappeared for a couple of months and then he came back. And, you know, he said, I made a decision. I want to do the campaign. And I was like, wait a second. 
have you considered what will happen in your life and how your life may change? And then looking at me with a seriousness that I had not seen before in him, uh, he said, and this is a quote that I kind of wrote down, you know, later. This is what he said. I want to do this because every time I speak to young people with HIV, every time I share the pain and the hope that I have for myself and for them, every time I mentor someone newly diagnosed, I feel as if there is an angel sitting on my shoulders. And it is in those moments that I know that this is why I was born. I was born to do this very thing, and he continues, to be the presence of support for those who are frightened, for those who have no hope. And now I want to be that and embody that more fully and be a sign of life for those who feel that their lives are being taken away from them. This is why I want to do this. And the fact that my friends may start treating me differently once they know that I have HIV is a risk that I am willing to take. This is my burden to carry. And carrying it without fighting with it gives me great freedom. A freedom that enables me to show up for others in a new way and with a new hope. Today, I know that I no longer have to apologize for who I am. Today, I know that I have a purpose and it is bigger than what the world tells me my life can be. And indeed, he did just that. And I witnessed so many times when his mentorship and his advocacy changed so much. It gave people hope. And thank goodness he's living very well now with the new meds and things. You know, he's, he's, he's doing really well and he's still helping others. And so, again, these are the examples, I think, of what happens when we follow our heartbreak, when we face the difficulties, when we accept our limitations, when we come to terms that it's okay to be with what can potentially break us into pieces. And I think that when we do that, we discovered some things. First, I think we we learn that to deny ourselves in that sense, um, you know, by not giving in to our fears, we are denying the world's hold on how and who we should be. Because while all the programs for happiness, you know, that are books and talks like this one and podcasts invite us into, you know, all those promises that promise us perks like relevance, belonging, success. A lot of those things say actually very little to us about what in the Christian tradition we call the will of God and what true aliveness in the divine looks and feels like. And so I think that this is what happens when we say yes to the heartbreak, when we come to terms with what we maybe think can't be accepted and simply deal with those things in a way that John of the Cross, uh, when he talked about the dark night of the soul, invited us to deal with, to simply sit with it, to consent to it, even if it makes, even if it means breaking into pieces with an understanding that What's generated through that experience is a perfect opportunity and the perfect opening for the divine to enter our lives, to pick up the pieces from the floor and to turn them into something that can become our gift to the world, our way of service. Okay, I think this is basically my spiel for today, uh, more or less. I hope it made sense. Hmm.